So in the last video, I was speaking about the Russian Civil War. And one of the components of that was looking at the different nationalities which tried to break away. And so in that video, as you could see, Ukraine actually did have a history of being an independent state, albeit for a very short amount of time. So from 1917 to 1921, you had the Ukrainian People's Republic. And actually, you could see inklings of this even back when you had the election of 1917. So Russia, or rather the former Russian Empire at that point, they held their only free fair election in 1917. And the results of that were very, very telling. So what you could see on the map here is that every region that would become Ukraine, except for one, voted overwhelmingly for the Ukrainian Socialist Revolutionary Party. So the Ukrainian Socialist Revolutionary Party, they obviously wanted a whole slew of different policies, but among them was Ukrainian independence. So as you can see here, you have, you have many, many people, in some cases over 70% of the people in these regions, voting for this Ukrainian Socialist Revolutionary Party. And the only region of Ukraine which didn't vote for this was the Tarida government, which is essentially what is today southern Ukraine and Crimea. So what's interesting is that Russia today controls what it's always known as a Novorossiya. And actually, Novorossiya has a lot of overlap with this Tarida government. And obviously, it was populated by many, many ethnic Russians. And this is part of the reason why I didn't vote for the Ukrainian Socialist Revolutionary Party, but instead voted for the Social Revolutionary Party, uh, which tended to be more distributed around the whole of Russia. So you can really kind of see all the way back then, almost 100 years ago, that the vast majority of Ukrainians wanted to be independent, but the people living in the south of Ukraine, they kind of wanted something a little bit different. Fast forward now to 1991, and this is where you're having the independence referendum within Ukraine. So this is obviously the collapse of the Soviet Union. And you can see from this election here that 92% of people nationwide voted for Ukrainian independence. And it had an 84% turnout. So in terms of the population as a whole, this represents 77% of the total electorate voting for independence. So it's not only a majority of those that turned out to vote, but it's an overwhelming majority of the entire electorate. However, the only region which is kind of the exception to the rule here is Crimea. So on paper, the majority of Crimeans voted for Ukrainian independence. However, the turnout was incredibly low. And this is partly because many people who are ethnic Russians boycotted that election. And so as a result of that, just 37% of the total electorate within Crimea voted for Ukrainian independence. And you can also see that in the Donbass region, uh, in the far east of Ukraine, you can see that there's a lot of kind of skepticism there as well. And what you can see with this is that even in the Donetsk region, 64% of the electorate there voted for Ukrainian independence, and 68% of them voted for Ukrainian independence in the Luhansk region. So clearly, you know, even though you know you can see that there's a bit of skepticism, still an overwhelming majority of people in these regions still voted for Ukrainian independence. So now fast forward from 1991 to 2019, and you can see this is the election which made uh, Vladimir Zelensky be the president of Ukraine. So Vladimir Zelensky, in the second round, he won 73% of the vote. And what you can also see is that the pro-Russian candidate uh, who was a uh, Yuri Boyko, he only won in the East in the first map, yeah? So that's something to kind of note, yeah, which is that, yes, still, although obviously people in 2019 still had their preferences, still it is the case whereby, if you actually look at the second round election, you can see that many different people living in Zaporizhia and many of these other places here, which uh, Russia now occupies, they voted overwhelmingly for Zelensky. So you can see that actually the narrative of you know the south of the country being much more pro-Russian, it's a little bit trickier to kind of, you know, it's a bit trickier to kind of paint that narrative, yeah, when you actually look at some of the nuances and some of the things which I uh, you know missed out last time. And actually something to note is that Yuri Boyko, he, just like many other uh, pro-Russians uh, who are living in Ukraine, now since the invasion, he has now become very skeptical of Russia and now he and his party have become very pro-EU. And you can see multiple instances of that throughout this last year. And you can see how basically people who you know they speak Russian, they 
are still opposed to Russia's invasion, right? You know, the famous thing where they have uh, these babushkas and they're speaking in Russian and, you know, they're throwing sunflower seeds at the Russians and saying that we hope that sunflowers grow over your graves. So whereas the invading Russians were expecting, uh, you know, the traditional thing of salt and bread, instead they are being offered sunflower seeds to basically saying, we hope that you die. So if you wanted a perfect illustration of how this war it really is the birth of a nation in a way that I kind of overlooked in those early days, in a way which I underestimate in those early days, because I kind of looked at how things were in like 2010, 2014, I kind of used that as a snapshot and basically kind of was like, right, okay, these regions here, which are Russian speaking, they want to be part of Russia. No, that's not actually the case. So clearly the feelings are not mutual, right? It's not, you know, they're not coming in as liberators, they're coming in as occupiers. And that's something which I underestimated last year when I was making all these different videos. And so that's what we're kind of going to explore now, which is what I got wrong and why I got these things wrong. So first of all, the why I got these things wrong. So that's as a result of two competing visions, right? So you have on the one hand, the realist vision, which is basically saying that there's fizz influence. So you have your know, American sphere of influence, you have the Russian sphere of influence. It's all to do with great powers and basically the international chessboard, as I kind of covered in my video on geopolitics. Definitely check that one out in particular. But what that ignores is the liberal vision, which is one of self-determination, right? So these different values of mine end up clashing because yes, on a, in a realistic sense, it's good to have an understanding of how different international players kind of operate on like a global scale but at the same time one also should have higher ideals and higher values than the very kind of amoral thing which is realism so realism just says what is the situation but liberalism says what ought to be the situation so what ought to be the situation is that those people wherever they are ought to have the right to self-determine they ought to say which country they wish to live under and so I overestimated how strong the feelings were amongst like, you know, the Russian speakers within southern Ukraine. And I thought that because that they speak Russian, that they would want to become part of Russia. When actually, this is not the case at all. And actually, the example which I'll use for my realist friends here who are still thinking like that is the case of England and Ireland. So obviously many people on this channel, you know, they came to the channel because, you know, they looked at like the, the history of Ireland, which I cover. But I'll use that analogy because the relationship between Russia and Ukraine is very similar to that of England and Ireland. So Ireland has an English speaking majority. Ireland has a long history of being part of the United Kingdom, but Ireland and England are still very separate places. So even though you have some people on the island of Ireland who are very pro-British, that doesn't mean that as a result of that, in order to try and you know, protect those people, that England has any right to invade Ireland. And even if, as I said in those videos, um, you know, the Cold War went differently. Say, for instance, if the Warsaw Pact was the one who ended up winning and they were the ones who ended up expanding uh, across Europe, if Ireland joined the Warsaw Pact, that would not give uh, England the, the right to invade Ireland, even though it'd be you know, national security, etc., etc. The world would condemn England's invasion of that and the Irish would be fully justified in resisting that invasion. At the same time, would I as an Englishman be, you know, feel a certain type of way about seeing English soldiers getting killed in Ireland? Yes, I probably would. Yes, you actually know, yes, I definitely would. So it's one of those kind of conflicting things where it's like, I see where the sides are coming from and I understand why the English might want to be in Ireland and I understand also why the Irish would want to be independent. So in the same way, I understand why the Russians see uh, Ukraine as being a part of them because of you know, historical kind of ties. But at the same time, I also see things from the Ukrainian side and see, actually, you know what? They're tired of being bullied by a stronger neighbor, right? They want to be their own country. And actually, regardless of whether they speak Russian or not, it's completely irrelevant because just because I speak the same language as you does not give you the right to occupy my country. Um, and I think that's what many Russian speakers in Ukraine are now feeling. They're feeling like, yes, we speak Russian, but that doesn't mean that I want Russian tanks rolling down the street. This is my country. This is Ukraine. So 
that's something which we've really seen. So I kind of underestimated this. This is kind of the birth of a nation, yeah, uh, in, any, in a kind of real sense. Now, all the divisions which were in Ukraine beforehand have kind of been swept to the side. So, you know, the East was more pro-Russian and like, you know, the West was more pro-Europe. Now, it's the thing where the whole country is now unified, right? And actually... The <laughs>